Welcome to another session of filling your knowledge gaps in year, year, year 13 before your A-level exams. This one is on the water cycle and water security. So we will cover the basic hydrological cycle key terms and processes. We will look at the El Nino Southern Oscillations, the Enzo Oscillations in the Pacific Ocean. And we'll finally look at the link between climate change and the hydrological cycle itself. So it should be a short session, this one. And we're going to start with the hydrological cycle. So remember, the basics to the hydrological cycle are that we have evaporation taking place from ground surface water, which condenses, cools, and forms clouds. It rains, and that goes back into the system, and it repeats. So that's the basic water cycle. But we also have the ideas of transpiration, infiltration into groundwater and the water table. We have surface runoff, we have interception and so on. So we're going to cover all of these things in this little section. And the key thing to remember is the hydrological cycle, a lot like sediment cells in coasts, is broken down into three simple sections. Inputs of water, the processes it goes through and the outputs of water. So the first idea is inputs. Now, the main input in any hydrological cycle is precipitation. That can be rain, heat, uh, sleet, hail or snow. And that has a significant impact on the hydrological cycle. Now, with snow, the entry of water will be delayed because it is, of course, snow, so it has to melt. So different forms of inputs include rain, heat, sleet, hail or snow. The amount will also affect it. So if there is a high amount of rainfall in an area, that will affect the drainage basin and the fluxes within it. The intensity of the rainfall can affect it too because it can increase the likelihood of flooding. Seasonality also has an impact. So different times a year, different seasons in different nations like the UK, of course, can affect the drainage basin system and how much water is being input into it. And finally, the distribution of it. Of course, where the rainfall occurs has a large impact on the drainage basin itself. So the River Nile and the River Ganges have different tributaries that start in different climate zones. So that has an impact on where the rivers form and so on as well. So there are your inputs. Then we have flows or processes. And there are seven different types of flows that are important here. So here we go. We have interception. And this is when plants and soils intercept or retain the water and it's absorbed by the vegetation. Now that can be evaporated as well. We have infiltration, which is where water soaks into the soil. We then have percolation. Now percolation is similar to infiltration, but it's a deeper transfer of water. So the water transfers into deeper rock and deeper soils. So it's a longer term transfer. We have through flow, which is literally a lateral transfer of water down slope through the soil. We then have groundwater flow. Now groundwater flow is a very slow transfer of percolated water in deep soil through permeable or porous rock. So this is when it goes through the actual rock itself into the deepest layer of the ground surface. We have surface runoff, and this is where the ground is saturated, so the water literally runs off the surface of the ground. It can be also called overland flow. And finally, we have river or channel flow, and this is where effectively the water gets into rivers and streams and it flows back out to the sea. The final section we have to look at is outputs. And the outputs of the hydrological cycle include three things. The first one is evaporation. And that is the process where moisture is lost directly into the atmosphere from the water surface, from soil and from rock and trees and plants and so on. We then have transpiration. That is the biological bit of this process where water is lost from the plants and the pores on the leaves themselves going into the atmosphere. And finally, we have discharge or channel flow. And this is where water is moved from one channel into another larger drainage basin, the lake or the sea. So from a river into the sea. So hopefully that clears up some of the ideas surrounding the hydrological cycle and the basics 
surrounding it, which are very important to remember to understanding the entire rest of this topic. Next, we're moving on to what I know is a contentious issue in year 13. Despite you having done it in GCSE, you still mix these up. So let's get this right straight away. Before you can understand El Nino and La Nina, you have to understand a normal year where El Nino or La Nina are not occurring. So in a normal year, trade winds, which are the average winds of an area, blow east to west. So they blow from the east to the west. Now, of course, in the Pacific Ocean, in the west is Australia. So they blow from South America to Australia. And that pushes warmer water slightly westward towards Australia. Now, remember, these winds are not very strong. OK, so in a normal year, we do not have very strong trade winds. And that means we get effectively evaporation, condensation and rainfall over the Pacific Ocean. We do not get high levels of rainfall or drought over Australia or South America. The air pushes the warm westward and therefore upwelling occurs in the Pacific and therefore in the Pacific Ocean we see the rainfall occurring. So that is a normal year. Now, that's key because that helps us understanding an El Nino year. An El Nino year is where the trade winds slacken or reverse. So what they actually do is they spread out the warm water completely across the Pacific Ocean. But specifically, the warmer water tends to move towards South America. That therefore means that Peru in South America receives heavy rainfall and therefore flooding. And Australia receives drought and no rainfall at all. And you can see on the top right diagrams, the air is forcing the warm water in El Nino towards South America, which means there's less warm water at Australia. And that is why these conditions take place. And finally, just so you're aware, El Nino events can actually cause drought conditions worldwide as a result of having a knock-on effect on other wind patterns around the world. Finally, we have La Nina. Now, La Nina may follow after an El Nino event. They usually occur every three to seven years. And this is where we have a cooler than normal surface ocean temperature. And you can see that in the diagram on the top left, where we have a lot more blue areas than red and orange. Now, because we have cooler than normal surface ocean temperatures, cooler water creates less rainfall. OK, the only bit of warmer water, as you can see on the map, moves towards Australia. So in a La Nina year, we have stronger winds moving towards Australia. That means Australia has heavy rainfall and because there are cooler winds at South America, South America has drought. So I'm going to recap this in the most basic way possible. Normal year, trade winds blow east to west, but they're not strong and therefore rainfall is over the Pacific Ocean. El Nino year, trade winds are very weak or actually go into reverse and go towards South America that means South America has heavy rainfall and Australia receives drought. And La Nina year is the direct opposite. Strong winds towards Australia. That means Australia receives high rainfall and South America does not. The Enzo cycles cannot be made any simpler than that. It is all controlled by the winds which move the water and the upwelling of warm and cold ocean currents causing rainfall in those areas. Final thing in this session is to look at three different things in relation to climate change. So climate change and its relation to the hydrological cycle. Let's just start with the basics in terms of precipitation and input. So warmer atmosphere holds more water, just like a warmer ocean holds more water. That means there's going to be higher rainfall totals. That means, of course, 
that we're going to see increasing changes in the amount of precipitation that takes place in the tropics and other areas. And heat wave lengths can increase as a result of that as well. But we also have evaporation and in places such as Asia and North America we see increases in evaporation due to climate change and we also see transpiration generally increasing as well and that affects soil moisture. So the first thing to say is that climate change causes changes in rainfall amounts, it causes a higher intensity of rainfall in some places and longer heat waves, but it also causes an impact on soil moisture and evaporation rates increasing as well in Asia in North America. We also have an impact of climate change on stores and flows, so stores and processes of water itself. So the stores, we're going to see surface runoff and we're going to see more low flows, more droughts and floods. So we're going to see more extremes of droughts and floods as a result of climate change. We're also going to see groundwater flow being uncertain in future, although there will be more droughts and floods, so more rainfall and less rainfall in certain areas, abstraction by humans from aquifers in groundwater flow areas make this uncertain to predict. In terms of flows of water, reservoirs, lakes and wetlands will see temperature increase and wetlands decrease in storage. Soil moisture will possibly change but not very much. There is more periods of drier and wetter weather, as we said earlier, more periods of intense rainfall and no rainfall at all, so it's difficult to tell. Permafrost in the Arctic regions, melting will take place, that deepens the active layer of the soil, that will release methane and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, and therefore that will cause further climate change. And also snow and ice storage, it's very highly likely that we'll see glacial retreat continuing, less snow cover in winter seasons, and that decreases our overall water storage as a result of climate change. The final thing that I'd say in relation to climate change and the water cycle is the uncertainty that climate change is going to cause. And you've already seen it in what I've said in the last two or three minutes. It's very uncertain to tell what will happen with certain parts of the water cycle. We know we're going to see increases in temperature and that's going to see greater evaporation. In summer, we know we're going to see evapotranspiration rising as well from forests and so on. We know that the impact of oscillations like El Nino and La Nina is leading to increased unreliable patterns of rainfall as well. So we are likely to see more frequent cyclones, monsoons, tropical storms threatening the supplies of water. We are going to see increased intensity and frequency of droughts as well as the patterns of rainfall change place to place. We're going to have to see more rain-fed agriculturists, more irrigation to feed us, to grow crops. We know we're definitely going to see depleted aquifers leading to problems with groundwater and leading to problems with water supply. We are going to see decreasing rainfall in a lot of areas due to global warming, but we may see increased rainfall in other areas. And we know for a fact that we are going to see snow and glacier melt and that threatens communities in mountain areas like the Himalayas and can cause flooding as well. So the key message is that climate change causes increased uncertainty for the hydrological cycle. There are many different flows, inputs and outputs that are going to change. And when you include the, the Enzo cycles and when you include increasing monsoons, cyclones, tropical storms and our increasing need for water as a supply, it's very difficult to predict where the impacts will greatly be seen and what those impacts will be. I hope you found that useful. Thank you very much.